So this community, uh, Sangha retreat, it, uh, I really appreciate those of you who've come up from Chithurst and Devon <coughs> to participate in this because, because this will be the, the last uh, winter retreat that I'll be uh, here. <clears throat> and this reflectiveness that, that I've, these like morning reflections, is uh, ways of looking or examining, reminding. So, in terms of teaching and me teaching you something or uh, you know, being a, someone who's trying to teach you Dhamma or thinking that I know more about it than you do or positions like this is not the point, is it? It's just uh, reflecting from my own experience, really observing, uh, you know, the, the conditions that I experience in my mind and through this formation, this bodily formation, its senses, its habits, its tendencies. And so it's like a, an example or encouragement uh, for each one of us to look at ourselves, to observe, be the observer, the knower. And to discern the that difference between the object and the subject. Like the personality, the sake did, he's always the object. Whatever you think you are, uh, you know, or believe you are, and any conditions that you identify with, the physical body, emotional habits, likes, dislikes, cultural conditioning, it's an arom, it's aramana, the Pali word aramana. It's an object in the mind. So this is a kind of, this is knowing, this is discerning from consciousness. Conscious, we, we're, we're all experiencing consciousness within the within individual forms. And then to, is consciousness individual? Or do I, you know, the, the bodies are certainly separate individual forms in this space. And so this is, this is what we call, you know, my body, my space, my feelings, my memories, my loves and hates. My opinion it comes from this uh, illusion of I am the conditions, I am the aramana, I am this person, this identity. And so mindfulness, sati is, uh, is the way the Buddha pointed to, this gate, this door, this escape from the born, the uh, originated, created, the formed. That most human beings are blindly attached to. We, we, you know, why are there so many problems in wars and hatreds and desires for revenge and resentments and, you know, among groups, the ethnic groups, tribal groups, nationalities, races, gender. Remember when uh, in, uh, in Rwanda, the Hutu uh, and the Tutsi tribe, now I've never been there, but I mean, where they'd been living together, you know, as neighbors and even intermarried, and then suddenly 
these identities, tribal identities, take over. And what happens is the Ramanas, we become, we separate, we become Hutus or Tutsis, and then we're uh, with that, then the, the emotions of resentment, jealousy, hatred, whatever arise. And yet, the same consciousness, you know, this consciousness of a Hutu, a Tutsi, a f French person or an English one, German or American or Thai, Singhalese, has, consciousness is not, has, has no nationality. <clears throat> no quality, it doesn't have any quality that you can, you know, it's not yellow or red or blue, it's not good or bad, it's not right or wrong, but without it, the rest couldn't exist. Without the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, and so in this practice, this. Uh, of the Buddha's teaching, you know, the, this teaching is all about pointing, getting us to let go <clears throat> of this blind obsession with conditioned phenomena. To the institutionalization of our selves, the firm beliefs in our own views, loves and likes and dislikes and cultural biases, religious prejudices, and all the rest that, that are divisive, limited, and mortal. And they are, they're the born, the originated, the created, the formed. So whatever you believe you are, think you are, whether it's good or bad or high or low, it's not what you are. You're not a thing, not an Ramana, not a personality. But then this sounds like, you know, like annihilation. If I'm not any of these things, then what am I? Is because this is, this is pointing to the, the boundaries of thought the thinking mind. We want to find out what we are. But this consciousness, pure awareness, brings us into pure subjectivity, impersonality, the deathless, the matadhamma, the unconditioned, unborn, unoriginated, uncreated. So that's why I, we've been using this chant, Ati Bhikkhuwe Ajat Dang Aputang Akatang Asankadang. Because to me this, this is, uh, I, I, this is the thing that really uh, I've used in my monastic life. Coming across it when I was a Samanera and reading in the, the book, The Word of the Buddha. As you know, it was the for a year, that's the only kind of reference book I had with me in uh, my Samanera seclusion in Nongkart. <clears throat> and so, it, and it, certain teachings kind of resonate, you know, they, more than others. And this, uh, this one, some people, it's just meaningless, you know, I realize that. <laughs> But in, it is, an in, you know, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. To me, that's a statement of great significance. It's like a Buddhist announcing, saying, you know, there is. Even within the, the seemingly hopeless, sensory impingement and complexities of the born, the created, the form, the conditioned. Because that's what we are as human forms, as individuals, as emotional creatures, as feeling entities, as men and women, as monks and nuns, as 
whatever. It, we become complicated, neurotic. Lost in a sticky web of conditioning. It's like you're just trying to get out of it. Is out of this sticky web, out of this conditioned realm, through being averse to it or wanting to annihilate it. It's like wherever you you know you free yourself, you're stuck in another place. It's just the you know you're on this in this web that that there's no escape from. In terms of Conditioning. There's no conditioned way you can escape from it. You're stuck onto it as a, as a, as an entity, as a human form, as a condition, in this conditioned realm, in this planetary realm, in this sensory realm. The only possible way that you can think of getting out of it is to destroy everything, commit suicide or blow up the universe or whatever. You know, it's a, that's the logic of the thinking mind, the dualism, you know. Or, you know, like modern tendencies now to make everything right, to try to refine the conditions. Get rid of the evil. Get rid of, annihilate the evil forces. Kill the devil. Annihilate the Taliban. You know, whatever we decide is a force of evil and we want to destroy it. And that's, that's the limitation of conditioning, isn't it? If I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. If I find something frightens me or intimidates me, I want to destroy it or run away from it. I want the security uh, that everything's going to be okay, that the British economy will get better and better, that this uh, economic crisis will cease, that uh, all the problems of the society will be solved that everybody will be happy and content, that uh, everything will be fair and just, and everybody will be enlightened. And so that's, that, you know, from the condition plane, that's, you know, what we would like, and then what we don't like is the other. We don't like economic crashes, depressions, recessions, you know, we don't want to call this a depression because that, that we remember, some of us, you know, were born in the depression of the 1930s, which was, you know, I don't remember it. I was so young then, but my parents were permanently affected by that. The rest of their lives, they, they worried about a depression, having another economic crash, another depression. Now they talk about democracy all the time, as if that's going to solve everything. If we just, everybody becomes, every country becomes democratic. And yet no matter how democratic you are, you know, there's still the problems have not been resolved. You know, in, in the basic delusion still operate. And within idealism and, and uh, you know, wanting things, wanting things to be other than what they are, not wanting things to be the way they are, wanting something you don't have, is, uh, you know, it's an endless trap. The sticky web, the desire realm. <clears throat>
One of the problems of being human is hubris. You know, that we, you know, the human individuals can assume they're all powerful. You know, so this is, you know, the idea of, of uh, hubris is this sense of inflation of one's power. I'm, I'm God, I know everything. Uh, and I know exactly what you all need and I, you know, promoting myself which is called inflating oneself into the ultimate position. <clears throat> and of course this always leads, and you read Greek tragedies or Sophocles or even modern stories like Hitler and, and all these dictators uh, within our memory. It was, it was the experience of hubris, of proclaiming oneself as the savior of the world, or the Messiah, or the Maitreya, or God, or, you know, the, the know-all leader. And, and then, of course, uh, this, uh, people get very intimidated, believe, disbelieve, react, war takes place, destruction. Now we all can, you know, there's a certain level of that in all of us thinking, I know best, or... The, the, the conceit of culture, like European culture, you know, assumed back in, before the First World War, that the, the Christian Western world assumed that it was somehow progressive and superior to the rest. You know, so you have colonies, colonize Asia, Africa, islands in the Pacific, North and South America, all like this. I mean, this idea we're bringing civilization. You know, this is a conceit, isn't it? That our civilization, what our view, our opinion is, is somehow more advanced than somebody else's. And of course, there's certain, you know, if you're totally convinced of that delusion, you, it gives you a certain power over others. Like a demagogue or a, a tyrant, you know, just through, through assuming authority and coming from that position of knowing everything intimidates people. They, they tend to, because, you know, it's, it's, we don't tend to think like that think of ourselves as gods that know it all. One of the problems, isn't it, of one, the third fetter is doubt, which is which is, you know, when we think and we, we, we doubt ourselves, we can be skeptical or uncertain, insecure. feeling of insecurity and uncertainty in our lives. So we will align ourselves maybe with, with uh, those who seem to be totally confident. You know, I know I'm the way you follow me. And then we, because we feel insecure, then we can easily go along with somebody that seems to know all the answers and tell us what to do. So notice in this, uh, the born, the created, the formed condition is basically, I'm God, I know everything, I know how to, if you follow me, you'll be saved and the whole world will be much better if, if everybody does what I want, is, you know, the, the Sakya Ditti carried to uh, the very extremity of insanity. It's totally outside the realm of of even acceptable behavior. Beyond the bounds of acceptable human aspiration, isn't it? Where I proclaim myself as superior to everyone else. 
<clears throat> or we can go to the other, you know, I'm, there's a certain security in being, I'm totally hopeless, failure, no good. You know, being a homeless tramp somehow has a certain appeal even to me, because then <laughs> you don't have to, you know, you're kind of settled for the bottom rather than, have, you know, if you place yourself always at the top of the pile, then you have a lot to live up to, and there's somebody always kind of trying to kill you or challenge you or put you down. But if you're at the bottom, then of course, <laughs> People just want to leave you alone, not even know you. So there's a secure, certain security in being a, like a tramp. Or, then I worked in, when I was in university, I used to work weekends at the charity hospital in Seattle. They'd bring in these tramps, you know, that were found uh, you know, we're on the streets, they'd bring them to the charity hospital and I'd have to clean them up. And of course I, at first I was quite repelled because you know, they, they stink and they're, they're kind of the kind of people you don't, you know, you've spent your life avoiding. And suddenly here, here I am in charge of them, taking these wretched men and having to bathe them sterilize all their clothes because they've got lice and whatnot. And they're thinking, you know, the thought of it really revolted me. But then in the actual work, you know, when you start talking and getting to know some of these people, you realize that they've, they've deliberately chosen such a life. Because they could also see the, the other, the competitiveness the ego involvement, the, the horridness of American competitive existence for men, of just this endless competition and drive, uh, and the kind of futility of it. So they just wouldn't participate in, and live the other way. <coughs> Dropouts. Now we, we kind of praise the, the kind of successful ones, you know, the ones at the top, this, the chief executive officer, the president, prime minister, the ones who really make something of themselves, and we despise the, the dropouts. So this is, and, but this is all conditioning, you know, whether you're a total failure, a dropout, hated by the society, resented or looked or despised, or, you know, you're, you're the most successful human individual in the whole world. It's still the sticky web of conditioning. <laughs> so then, there is the unborn, the un originated, uncreated, unformed. That's a statement, isn't it? It's not a philosophical concept. Like, I believe there's, uh, you know, something like the orig unoriginated, unformed. It's, uh, you know, I like to take it quite literally. There is ati. This Pali word ati, there is bhikkhus. The unborn, uncreated, unformed unoriginated. And because there is the unborn, unoriginated, the uncreated, unformed, there is escape from the born, the originated, the created, the forms. <clears throat> so this is, this is the, this is quite a, you know, this gives us a, a possibility of getting off this web, not through, through destroying anything, but Transcending it, no longer being bound, conditioned, trapped with the identities on the sticky web of conditioning, the samsara. We, we're not destroying it or rejecting it, 
But we're no longer stuck on it either. We're no longer bound into it, programmed, lost in it, deluded by it. And so that is the, there is the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. Now then you apply that to the here and now, Pachubana Dhamma. Because those are just words, and they can be inspiring or give us hope or faith. But then it's not about, <clears throat> you know, just reciting it in Pali and translating it into English or, or thinking about it. Then reflectiveness is actually, what is it right now? Pachubanatama, if there is the unborn, uncreated, unoriginated, unformed, what is it? You know, it has to be here and now. It can't be something el somewhere else or some other time. It can't be about the future. Of when I get my samadhi together, then I'll get it. Or <clears throat> I'm practicing now. Uh, with all these, you know, with these kilesas, these defilements, with these bad habits, with my personality and my problems, in order to uh, resolve them sometime in the future. And then maybe I will understand and, and recognize the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. That is Sakaya Ditti, isn't it? That's the self-view. <clears throat> so that's why, why it is, uh, it's, a, it's subtle, it's almost, it's ab abrupt, it's like, well, wake up here and now. Pay attention. The unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. Now, when you stop thinking and, 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 and stop, you know, stop trying to control your mind and, and uh, try to get something you don't have and get rid of something you have, when you have that shock, maybe, like a, a shock, suddenly your, your thinking mind stops. And you're suspended in the state of just attentiveness, pure awareness. You know, so then mindfulness is, is recognizing this. Now we can't just go around expecting shocks to do it for us. <laughs> There's a limit to, limited limitation on just seeing that I need to be shocked all the time in order to recognize. <laughs> so out of compassion, the, the Buddha, you know, gave some very skillful means, like, the Dhamma teachings to reflect and investigate and remind to, you know, therefore, they're very practical teachings. They're not airy fairy philo philosophical, metaphysical ideals. So, well, like, uh, intuitive awareness, sati sampachanya, this is consciousness, and it's consciousness, pure. Consciousness operating, it has a continuity, it's not a, a, a momentary thing, it's like it's here all the time, and then whatever we put into it, out of ignorance of each other, then we, you know, I create myself, my views, opinions, I create you, you know, so memory, we have these memories and retentive memories, so we remember and we have names for each other, we have views, personal opinions, personal attitudes, tendencies, biases that 
we fully committed to uh, out of ignorance to what I think in my view or my I'm right, the sense of being right, or maybe uh, being so uncertain of yourself that you believe somebody else who says they're right. You say, Ajahn Sumato's right, so I'll believe and go along with him. So then you, you know, you're not really observing what you're doing. You're being caught onto the sticky web in a way that it, there's no way out of it other than, you know, you just be stuck there. For how many more lifetimes have we all been on this web, this complicated, sticky death realm of beginning and endings, births and deaths? So in this lifetime, within this incarnation of the human, of your own human body, you know, this is the, this is the chance of a lifetime, <laughs> or maybe many lifetimes, to, to break out of it, to see it, to learn, to, to be able to free yourself from delusion of this commit, blind commitment, helpless, powerful sangsaric conditioning, this sticky web that no matter how hard you try to pull yourself out of it through ignorance, you're, you get even more stuck into it, more lost and deluded by it. <clears throat> so then the, the there is the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. Mindfulness, the path, the way. And then mindfulness is the simplicity, ultimate simplicity of pure conscious attention, awareness, here and now. Now consciousness is expansive, it has no boundary. But the boundaries we put, we create in consciousness are, you know, me and mine, the conventions, we have the identities that we, you know, what we think we are, our beliefs, our doubts, our fears. So in the, like the five khandhas, the uh, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana, the six uh, senses, the ayatanas, consciousness through the senses, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. So consciousness, we're sensory, uh, when we experience life through the senses, through the body, then, then that's all we know. We, we see it always in the limitation of pleasure, pain, me and mine. But because we can be aware of sense consciousness, we can observe, we can be the knower of seeing hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling. You know, if we couldn't do that, then there'd be no hope. We'd just help us victims of our conditions. We just, you know, what if we get good conditions in the past or terrible ones, we're the victims of it. Of what happens, of the past, of what others say and do, of the societies and, and that that we live in. We're just helplessly lost and victims of unfairness, injustice, wars, violence. <clears throat> so, 
But because there is the unborn, uncreated, then there is an escape. And that, of course, the Buddha, this mindfulness, sati, sampachanya, panya discerning. And so the simplicity of discernment, of knowing the condition, And that's what, you know, on this retreat I've been trying to emphasize, trust yourself in knowing conditions. You know, knowing feeling is feeling. Seeing is seeing. Hearing is hearing. Smelling is smelling. Tasting is tasting. Thinking is thinking. Knowing is like this. So that you, there's this knowing of conditions, uh, and the five khandhas, the sensory uh, consciousness, and the and the experience of feeling and and uh, pleasure, pain, beauty, and ugliness, of neutrality, as we can be aware of of whether you know whether present moment is pleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. This knowing then, the consciousness with wisdom, discerning, knowing when there's hatred and when there isn't any. Discerning hatred or dosa is like this. And when, it, and when you, when in this way, you're not <clears throat> judging it or indulging or suppressing, you're just recognizing hatred, dosa is like this. And if you're patient with with a, a rising of anger in your mind, if you allow it, you know, neither act or speak on it, then it ceases. And then there's discernment of non, of adosa, non-angers like this. This is, this is discern. this is panya. Panya is not about good and bad, right and wrong. There's a kind of worldly wisdom on that level, you know, so lokutra panya is, you know, knowing to do good, refrain from doing bad, to discriminate, to know that the result of doing good things and doing bad things, you know, so there's a, a, a level of worldly wisdom, but lokutra Lokya Panya, rather, is about the world. Lokutra Panya is discerning the unborn, knowing the unborn by no longer blindly being deluded by the born or the created. So then, you know, apply that to the present moment right now, each one of you. So then you, you're, you're knowing that right now this pure reflective conscious awareness like in my, from at this moment observing my, from this point here there's no anger Just observing, there's no anger in, in consciousness at this time. I'm watching, there's watching, knowing. So this is adosa, non-anger, it's like this. 
noticing it, you know, affirming it, so that you you recognize consciousness. Consciousness knows itself is reflective. No greed, no hatred, no delusions like this. Now when I do this, because I, I notice this sound of silence. It has this stream-like, it's not a dead kind of, you know, a kind of blackout. It's fully, for his full attention, alertness, Where, and from this, of course, conditions arise and cease. So it's not, not annihilating conditions or annihilating greed, hatred, and delusion or trying to get rid of your sakya ditti or your personality or your ego. It's not trying to, to uh, completely destroy your social, cultural conditioning or an attack on thinking. You've got to annihilate thinking, discrimination. It's not that, but it, it, it puts that ability to discriminate, to judge, in a relationship that you can, you know, that you can uh, operate with it. You can develop it, cultivate a way of, of living your life out of wisdom, rather than out of just habit, prejudice, biases, fixed views, fears, and desires. <clears throat> so from this, then the Vinaya is, is, a, is a convention for living one's life in the human form that is, um, you know, if used properly, is a way of living in the world out of compassion. So then, you know, in the in the Eightfold Path is the, you know, after the insights of the three, first three noble truths, there is suffering, there is, suffering has been realized, there are the causes of suffering and uh, the to be let go of, letting go has been, uh, you know, has been accomplished. There is uh, the end of Dukkha, this is, this is recognized now, end of dukkha. It's always here in the, in the jitta, isn't it? The end, the beginning, the ending, and the observing of beginning and ending. And then there's right, samaditi samasangapo, which is uh, Right, under, perfect understanding. Then. This is perfect understanding and uh, following this sequence. This isn't just uh, right understanding in terms of lokia, of the worldly, worldly wisdom. This is perfect. This is complete and perfect understanding. Enlightenment, in other words. Samaditi samasangapo. And that you know, inclines us toward how we live our lives in the lifespan that we have within this form. Toward samavaja, samagamanto, samachivo, right speech, right action, right livelihood. So in the use of vinaya, then samavaja, samagamanto, samachivo, is perfected if lived in the right way. You know, if not, if we identify uh, 
cling to Vinaya and, and, and the uh, structures of Vinaya and identify ourselves with always out of ignorance and sakyaditi with, with uh, the Vinaya, then of course we've missed the point. It's not for clinging, for attachment, for ignorance. It's for mindfulness. That's the whole point of Vinaya. It's for awareness, not for attachment, identity, personal positioning. So Samawaja, you know, this is being able to speak to say, to use our voice, you know, how we relate through speech to the world around us, to the society we're in. So it's a, you know, from some it, perfect understanding, perfect intention, then perfect speech, perfect action, perfect livelihood. So then there's alms mendicant. It's perfect livelihood. Gamanto sama, gamanto sama, achivo. You know, how we relate to the society, to living here in, in England, for example. In this society, in this country, is not to cause it problems, be divisive, be judgmental, you know, promote certain political views and, and create forces against, for and against, but to, for sama waja sama gamanto sama achivo is live in this, this style of the samana. Alms mendicant that has so much faith, so much confidence in the goodness of humanity that, that we're willing to put ourselves on the edge as depending for the basic necessities for survival, depending on that, that through our wisdom, through our cultivation of this way, that, that these basic necessities the support that are necessary for just physical survival will be provided. So in that way, we're, we, you know, our presence in this country is not to just take advantage of a system or use it or to, you know, convert it or cause more religious divisions or problems or uh, angst or difficulties to this country. It has enough without us adding to it. But so there's some uh, right action, gamanto some achivo, right livelihood. So in this way, you know, see that, that as we live, fulfill our, our, our position in society is summon us. Those who are content with little, not greedy, not caught in the, in the com competitiveness and the, and the uh, views and the present day opinions and ideals and uh, that of modern British society, we're not condemning it either. We're not judging it. But our, how we live in this society isn't through, you know, through personal preferences or views, but through compassion, through metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. And then, of course, some uh, 
วายาโมสมาสติสมาสมาธิ perfect effort perfect mindfulness perfect concentration so that is the you know this equanimity u p e k a there's a sense of stillness awareness stillness Are not just emotional cripples anymore, going up and down according to, you know, the worldly d a m a s You know, when we're personalities, then we're emotionally charged all the time: praise and blame, success, failure, good fortune, bad fortune, good health, bad health. Our, our happiness depends on on being praised and being successful and. Being happy, and then our misery is through feeling a failure, or being blamed, or criticized, or rejected, having illnesses, sicknesses, being looked down on. That's uh, you know. So the eight worldly d h a m m a s and then there's lokutara, transcending. These eight worldly d h a m m a s is the knower of them, not the one who identifies and is deluded by these eight worldly d h a m m a s Now, the knower of the eight worldly d h a m m a s is not any of the eight worldly d h a m m a s That's the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. <coughs> Then the the Sakaya Diti, the first three fetters to stream entry, is uh, you know this is this is the world. This is the conditioning process. This uh, this is how I see myself, me and mine. What I think, my position, my role. So, as a senior monk, as a patriarchal old Mahatera, as an Upachaya preceptor, all these things, all the, you know, as someone who's the big cheese, maybe, or the boss. You know, how many of you see me in those perceptions? Big father, authoritarian figure. That's not how I see myself, actually. On the Sakya d i t i level, I don't see myself through those kind of perceptions. But I mean, I get feedback where a lot of times people see me through that because that's that's the conditioning process, you know. The, The size, the gender, the position, the power—all this is is pers- personified and and then reacted to. But that which is aware of what your reactions are—you know—I can't kind of command you to feel a certain way. Say you should respect me. You know, then I become like a a nagging. Person, you know that you should respect your elders, and you should be grateful for all I've done for you. And then, blah, 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 and then I, I go on a tirade of all the things I've done here and for you, and and uh, I expect gratitude and respect for that. And that is, you know, that's a tyrant, isn't it? That's a nagging, intimidating tyrant. That's a k a d i t i Or to go the other way, I'm just humble, just like you. I don't hold myself as being special. I'm just an ordinary guy. That's the American view. Americans, we always want to bring everybody into the most familiar positions. 
Like you go to the States and they find it difficult, you know, someone like myself, because I am an American, and they say, Ajahn Sumedho sounds so stiff and formal. I go to Thailand and I can be called Tanjau Kun Rat Sumeta Chariya. <laughs> and it goes even on further, but I forget the whole title. <laughs> but, but in America, that, that would be ridiculous. You know, go home, tempt my sister to say, Tanjau Kun Raja Sumeta Chariya. So inevitably, they want to call you Bob, which is a name I loathe. And then one old friend wants to say, old pal, old buddy to me all the time, you know, like we used to be. That's the American in it, you old, my old buddy, my old pal. In England, they're a little more respectful. They don't quite sink that low. <laughs> But an American, you know, they want to call me Sumato, or no, that's even that too formal. Maybe Sue. <laughs> and there's a great country and western song about what is it? <laughs> this rough cowboy that was embarrassed because his mother named him Sue. But these are cultural differences, isn't it? Like Thailand has a Buddhist, you know, Buddhism is so integrated into its culture that these, this deference, these titles, these things are a part of a cultural thing, so they're not embarrassing or out of place or af affected, you know, kind of uh, titles that, that uh, sound silly in, in a context they like the United States. But also to to want to go into the old old buddy palsy wowsy place is not appropriate either. I mean, we're samanas now. The samana, you know, is uh, right action, right speech, right action, right livelihood, and so we're not demanding respect or or people to to uh, treat us as we're as if we were high-ranking priests or anything. We're, we're mendicants. We depend on the kindness and goodness of others for our survival. So our relationship to the society is not demanding or putting ourselves in a kind of positioning of, of a priesthood or a, you know, a kind of Brahmin caste or anything like that. So remind yourself, you're, you're like a beggar. You're a mendicant. You're not an important person, a great master, a meditation teacher, uh, you know, a, an inspiring example to the world or anything like this. It's not, you know, coming from these elevated positions that oftentimes we're placed in by the society. You know, so the society raises up and say, Tanjau Kun Raja Sumeta Charya is a great meditation master. I don't operate from that perception. That's, people may put that perception onto me. But my reflection is a samana, alms mendicant. Bhikkhu. And if I see myself operating from this, I'm the great meditation master position, you know, I can recognize it. I know it for what it is. And I don't, you know, I don't want to hold on to such, an, such a perception of myself as being 
a great meditation master or a highly regarded senior monk of great you know, significance in the Buddhist world, things like this. That's not a perception I want to, to perpetuate or operate from because I can see that it would be just deluding myself. Sakya Ditti operates, takes me over. So in this position of the alms mendicant is, a, you know, is right speech, then right speech, samma vaja, samma gamanto, samma chivo, can operate from there, not from being an important person or a famous figure or a special person, special being. So in this sense, we're all something like the ordained sangha, the the uh, bhikkhu sangha, siladhara, the samanas. You're putting yourself on the edge of depending on the goodness of others for your survival. Now that is a great sacrifice when you think of it. You're letting go of a lot of what we're culturally conditioned to not do, to not trust. Not put yourself on the edge, but to, to demand security and rights and privileges and, and all kinds of things from uh, this country, from society. So, the, but then, <clears throat> so this is, uh, but this summon opposition is, it's worthy of respect because it's, it's trusting in the goodness of the society we're living in. We're, you know, being, taking the, the samana precepts here in England, for example, is an act of trust, isn't it? That you're trusting that, that the people in this country, that, that by this simple act of renunciation and your determination for liberation from delusion, then that's uh, your position in the society is, is one of right action, right livelihood. You're bringing into the consciousness, by example, of relinquishing non-pride, non-arrogance, non-conceit, non-divisiveness, just a, non, a nobody, not a, a great person, a personality, or being, uh, you know, trying to intimidate all the rest of the people. They should be just like you. You know, I could be a, an arrogant samana. You know, you should all be like me and uh, humble like I am. <laughs> I'm the living, ex living example of complete, honest humility. <laughs> and of course, that's ridiculous, isn't it? It's not, it's not being anything. Being this knowing, this unborn, uncreated, unformed. Being this awareness. So it's not like you have to find out who you are. You're just recognizing, realizing what you're not. You're not any of the things you think or the physical bodies you have or the position you're in. You're not even a monk or a nun or an anagarika or a lay person. These are conditions. They're un they are what they are, you know, so... We have tall monks and short monks, senior monks, junior monks, nuns, tall nuns, short nuns. <laughs> European nuns, Asian nuns. These are just the discrimination of the conditioned realm. 
then in, <clears throat> then they because we live together in a community, then the the vinaya is how we the agreements we have on duties, responsibilities that we we, we accept within the structure of the uh, traditional vinaya. So this is the challenge you we all face, you know, to. And, and if you're willing to do it, then you can. You can root out the, the, this basic ignorance. Kind of uh, extirpate delusion. Let go of the conditions that, that create the illusions in order to abide in the pure unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, which is ultimate reality, which is truth, which is Dhamma. Thank you.